Before I start the storytelling, I will show you first the title of the story, the author, the characters, the settings, and its genres and themes. The short story entitled The Tale of Tonya the Brave by Maria Alia G. Tabuklaon. And the characters are Francisco, Carmicinta, Fernando, Alejandro, Tonyo, Apo, and the Supernaturals, or they call them as Not Like Ours. And the setting is in Kanda Bukidnon. And the genre of the story is horror fiction, and its theme is all about the supernatural. So, let us now start our storytelling. The Tale of Tonyo the Brave by Maria Alia J. Tabuklaon Come here, mga apo. You want me to tell you a story? Then you must come nearer and sit at my feet. Don't interrupt me as my memory is a fleeting as the summer breeze. And you may find that an interrupted story is worse than no story at all. I had been telling you war story before of things that happened to your father and to your father's father who was my brother. Now what I am going to tell you is a little different, but something that you will hopefully remember when you find the need for this memory. I was the third son of Francisco, a town hall clerk, and Carmicinta, a housewife in a small town called Kanda, somewhere south in Bukidnon. It is far from here, very far. To go there, you have to travel by ship or airplane, and by bus for more than 12 hours. We live in a small house, made smaller by the fact that there were three sons, all not far apart in age. Fernando was the oldest. Alejandro, your grandfather, followed after a year, then me barely a year later as well. After that, Nana just declared she would not get pregnant again, and indeed, she didn't. We were boisterous as all boys are, and it was all that Nana could do to keep us in place. We had no household help, and aside from our three cats, five kittens, two dogs, a flock of chickens, and two pigs, we only had Apo, Nana's father. Apo was 84, but he was still spray and lively. He would wake up early every morning, rouse us out of bed, nag us to do our chores, scrubbing the floors, watering the plants, feeding the animals, among other things. And we would then sit in the veranda the whole day, puffing on the rolled beetle leaf, spitting out the reed go into a small can beside him. Often I would sit with Apo and he would tell me stuff about the war and the times that his family had to leave their home in the middle of the night as the shelling and the bombing started in their town. There were times as well when Apo talked about the not like ours, his term of the supernatural. He had seen a capre, he said he had also been friendly with a duende and had witnessed a man and a girl flapping its wings. I spent so much time with Apo that my brothers picked on me constantly, called me Assisi. That was their favorite town, for they knew I hated to be called that. Was it my fault then that sometimes I like Apo's company better than theirs? I was no wimp. I played their games and excelled at some. I was the best when it comes to playing with marbles, and nobody could catch me when we were playing tag. But I did not like hunting, which was one of their favorite pastimes. I love birds, and I hated to see them hurt. I cried once when I saw Fernando hit Amaya in the chest, the poor bird falling from a branch, merely stunned or dead. I didn't know. I ran away before they could see my tears. But I let them be. I worried that they would tease me even more if I cheated them about hurting birds. I refused to go hunting with them after all. I was still the undisputed champion and had the biggest marble collection in the town. One day, when Fernando was 14, Alejandro 13, and I 12, Tatay came home with bad news. The body of Budok, a farmer from another barangay, was found that morning. It was mangled beyond recognition, and only the guitar embossed with his name, lying just a few feet away, and his clothes identified him. A young boy was looking for his dog found the animal sniffing the body behind a bamboo clump not far from town. According to Tatay, it was the second such murder in two months, but they had not worried before because the victim was a stranger and the murder had taken place in Antel, a town a day walk away. What a queer, Tatay said, was that someone pulled out Budok's and the stranger's internal organs. According to the doctor, neither a bolo nor a knife was used for the crime, 
which didn't make sense at all for that would mean that the person used his hands. And how could a pair of hands do the damage it did? Apo was at his usual place in the veranda, listening to Tatay, but hearing that the murderer used his hands, he stood up and came nearer to us. He used his hands, eh? he said, sitting next to Tatay in the sala. That's right, Tai, my father answered, holding Nana's hands, but the doctor is still examining the body and talking to the coroner from Antel. He will have a full report soon. Is it Doc Morales? When my father nodded, Apo surprised us when he stood up and went outside. I am going to see him. When Apo came back late that night, he was unusually silent. He didn't eat supper with us and stayed in his room. We heard him rummaging in his cabin once or twice and then all was quiet. What's he doing? Alejandro asked. Nobody answered. It was a solemn dinner with Tatay and Nanay silent thinking perhaps of the murder and upon not there to chastise us for not doing our chores well. Maybe he's smoking again, arranging his barrel rolls in the wooden chest of his, said Fernando, who didn't think much of Apo. Before I could think of a rejoinder, Apo came out of his room. In his hand was a long bronze dagger, easily a foot in length, and a piece of cloth. He sat at his usual place in the table and polished the blade, oblivious to the five pairs of eyes staring at him in astonishment. Tai, what's that? Nanay asked, not daring to believe that her beloved, usually harmless father was now holding a lethal weapon. That's a nice piece of work. I don't see many bronze dagger nowadays, Tatai said, admiring the thickness and the sound of metal. What are you going to do with it, Tai? Apo put down the blade and faced all of us. No longer the blabbering barrel smoking old foggy, but a strong, wise man about to impart wisdom to his brethren. We are not dealing with something ordinary here, he said. Where? Fernando interrupted. Tata shot him and gestured for Apo to continue. I've been to Doc Morales. The coroner's report from Antel arrived already, and he's finding much that of Doc Morales. It was done by a woman. At this... He held up a hand as well all tried to ask him at the same time how the doctors knew. And personally, I know who did it. At this point, he paused dramatically, and when he spoke, it was barely a whisper. It was done by a knot like ours. Nobody spoke, not even Fernando, whose credibility I was sure was already stretched to its limits. I think it was because Apo sounded really ominous. It was a relief then to hear Tatai ask Apo, how they arrived at the conclusion, and what type of creatures did Apo think the culprit was. To my surprise, Apo turned to me. You remember the story I told you, Ton? I nodded. Ah, but which? About the Manlalayug, he said, and I nodded again, wondering what the connection was. You see, Apo continued, the other day I was just telling Tonyo about the creatures called the Manlalayug, and that's why I got suspicious when I heard you describe the body. It occurred to me that I have seen the type of murder before, so I went to the doctors to see if he could find strands of the woman's hair and piece of broken nails to prove my hunch. But given that you do find those items which you say you did, how could you conclude that it was the man alive for sure? That I asked. He was trying to steal Nana's hands which were nervously wringing the tablecloth of the dining table. Apo leaned into Tatay's face. You know Budok? Tatay nodded. He is young, isn't he? And strong? Tatay nodded again. How then can a woman claw his face and pull off his internal organs with her own hands? How can you explain that? But she may have used a blunt instrument like a spoon, or she may not be alone, or... Or Tatay trailed off his mid-sentence which he saw Apo's face. Apo was shaking his head and he looked sad and not a little afraid. Nobody believes in them anymore, he whispered, and it will be our death. Wait, Tai, tell us please, what's a manlalayug? We really don't know. Apo looked at each of us in the eyes, then turned his back. When he spoke, his voice was very low as if he was afraid of being heard and we all had to lean forward to catch his word. When I was just a little older than Fernando here, he said, a man alive came to our town. She managed to kill five men within five months, 
before one finally succeeded in stopping her. A mana lion is a creature that possesses special powers. Once she is hunting, killing her becomes a challenge, for she transforms into a very beautiful woman who will certainly use her considerable charm to weaken a man's will. The Manla Layo prowls at night and hunts for men who are alone. Once a man is completely enraptured by her, she will wrestle him to the ground, for she has extraordinary strength, and she will eat his internal organs. And that is not only her power. She will also pull your mind. It was said that there were men who did not come under her spell, but still died because when they met face to face, they just stabbed her. The woman they were facing, not knowing that it was just her image, the real her was behind them. But how can you kill her then? Alejandro interrupted. Stop backwards, I said, before Apo could speak. For even if you don't see her ba real body, it is there behind you. Apo looked at me. Approvingly, I thought. Yes, Tonyo is right. You should stab backwards. If it is the real metal, like this bronze blade. Once is enough, then you should run and run for all your worth, for even a dying manlalai can cause you with her last breath, and that will be the end of you. Nobody spoke, and the air was full of fear and wonder. I thought, for the extent of a post knowledge that we had only seen at this moment. But who was the man that killed the manlalai in your town? And you don't tell me about this before Tai. Nane was proning but she has let go of the tablecloth and was now absently flattening it. Apu sighed and looked at the dagger, turning it this way and that. He didn't speak for a while, and we all thought he wasn't going to answer Nanes when he finally spoke. I didn't tell you because there was no reason to. I never thought this would happen again, he said. He looked at Nane. The man who killed her was my father, your grandfather, who I told you died of malaria when I was 15. It seems that my great-grandfather managed indeed to wound the Manlalayu. Unfortunately, he didn't leave until the woman seemed dead. She cursed him, Apo said, telling him that he will die before the month was to end. Our great Lolo died within a week, but not before telling his 15-year-old son everything that he knew about the monster he visited. He gave him the dagger to keep, as well reminding him that he should follow his father's footstep should the same thing happen again. But he was already too old, too old. Apu was shaking his head, looking at the weapon in his hands wistfully. That's why I took out this dagger, in case someone is willing to hunt the man alive. She won't be coming out until the next full moon, so we have time to prepare. Tate stood up raking his hand through his hair. How can we tell the mayor or the police about this? They will laugh at us. Then don't. But we can't let her kill again, if indeed it is a man alive. Apo sighed. Isko, we can't let the authorities do everything. So what do you suggest we do? I can't very well do it, if that's what you are suggesting. Tatay was glaring at Apo, and Apo was glaring back. And why not? You're still young and strong. Tai, Nana was furious. She stood up and faced Apo. How can you say that? We have three children, and what are the police there for? Nana was almost shouting, and Tatai had to calm her and lead to her to their bedroom. Apo looked at us. Sometimes we have to be brave, my boys. Then he too went to his room. The next morning, nothing was said of the incident. Apo did not talk about the Manalayog and neither did my parents. But there was a tension in the air as the weeks passed and the doomed night neared. On Thursday, the night before the full moon, Alejandro brought up the subject while we were in the bed. Do you think she will strike again? He said. Fernando Horam, it's just one of Apo's tale. You want to bet nothing will happen tomorrow? How can you say that? I protested. Apo was telling the truth. You saw his face when he was telling us about his father. How can you ignore it? Way to go, Tonyo. We didn't know you really believed that, Alejandro said. He whispered something to Fernando and they laughed. Within moments, they were chanting, Si, 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 si. Wanting to strike back, I muttered, 
You just don't want to face her. You're just afraid you'll be next victim. Fernando sat up and brought his face close to mine. So you're not afraid, huh? Well, brave boy, why don't you take a post dagger and find the man like yourself? Find the man lion? What a crazy idea. She'd have boys like me for breakfast and still have room for more. I turned my back on Fernando and kept silent. But my brothers guessed the reasons for my silence and resumed their chanting once more, punctuating it with hazes. Feeling their guys bite and realizing that the only way to stop their jizzing was for me to agree to what they wanted me to do. I almost shouted, Yes! Yes! I'll do it! I'll kill her! The words had been empty, but when I said them, I realized that I really had to do it. Not for my brothers, nor for myself, but for my fathers. If I would not go, and the man alive claimed another victim tomorrow, Tatai would be forced to hunt her himself despite what Nanai had to say because he would feel obliged. I couldn't, I wouldn't, imagine what would happen if I failed. I turned to Alejandro and told him, firmly, I hoped, no, I'll go, otherwise Tate has to, and you know Nanai is already mad at Apo for saying he has to do it. Alejandro touched my arms, suddenly contrite. We didn't really mean that, Ton, we were just teasing. My brothers realized then what I had already understood, and they too were silent. Fernando slung his arm around my shoulders and said, real softly, Are you sure you can do it, Ton? I looked at him in the eyes and said just as softly, Yes. The next day, my brothers were unusually quiet, thinking perhaps of what I had to do that night. When Apo went to the usual place in the veranda, they helped me look for the bronze dagger in Apo's bedroom. We found it on top of his clothes in the cabin, and we hid it on my closet. Nobody was able to eat dinner, and though my parents were greatly puzzled for my brothers and I, were usually voracious eating no matter what the food was. They did not comment, lost in their own thoughts as well. We said goodnight, and my brothers and I laid down on the mat all intense and waiting for the time that I could safely leave the house. When we were sure that our parents and Apo were asleep, we rose. I took out the dagger from the closet and tucked it into the waistband of my pants. Better carry it, Fernando whispered. So you're ready any time. Alejandro hugged me. I patted his back, saying I would be back before they knew it. I was down the stairs already when Fernando tried to pull me back inside the house. Ton, don't do it. Please, you'll get yourself killed. I pulled out of his grasp and said, I won't. I'll take her. Then I ran, ran into the wide streets and into the open fields that I lay between us and the town proper. I reached the town in 10 minutes, tired by my run. I plopped down on bench in the plaza contemplating the next action. Should I spend the whole night there? The bench was cold, and after my run, the air was chill. I only had a thin t-shirt and a pair of short pants. Good for running, I thought then. And though I was accustomed to cold weather, the air that night was especially biting. I was shivering within minutes. My heart was beating rapidly. I seemed to be the only one awake in the whole town and I was sitting in the middle of the plaza with only the bronze dagger to comport me. I, I looked around and everything was in shades of grey. Some bats screeched and a few cricket trips, but otherwise I was alone and I could hear noises, noises that my nocturnal companion did not make. I was hearing the noises of the night and it seemed to come from everywhere yet from nowhere. I suddenly had a name for what I felt fear and it was fear that slowly filled my whole being finally i couldn't take it anymore the bats the cold the gray shape that seems to be moving towards me and the utter stillness of everything around me i stood up and began to run back home burying myself for the foolishness of my pride and cursing my brother for forcing me to prove my masculinity on my way back passing by the first rice field I realized that nothing stirred. I slowed down to a walk and listened. 
Not a single stalk of rice moved. Not a single cricket chirp. I remembered thinking that it was too calm, too still. I was halfway through the second rice field when I detected movement ahead of me. I hoped to God that it was only one of my brothers or our neighbors pillowed the drunk card or anybody except the one I thought it would be. I was already sweating profusely, though my palms were cold. My grip on the dagger slipped more than a few times, and I had to grope for it on the ground since I did not want to take my eyes off from what might be in front of me. I suddenly realized that everything was becoming very, very real. My brothers and their dares were a million years away. This was reality, me holding a cold piece of metal in the middle of nowhere, shivering because of the cold and because of something moving in front of me that I couldn't see. This was my reality, and I was deathly afraid. I considered what to do, go back to the town and wake someone up to accompany me back home, or go ahead. I was standing indecisively when the matter was taken from my hands. I saw her just a few steps me, appearing quite suddenly, all woman, all flesh. Her movements were gracefully and her hair was very, very long, moving with a life of its own, trailing after her like a black luminescent gown. And she was looking at me, and she seemed to see deep into my soul. I knew at that moment that it was her, the man Lalayug I had been waiting for and wanting to hunt. But knowing that it was her did not stop my growing interest for her. I let her get closer, fascinated by the way she walked. She was gliding, and her feet did not touch the ground. Of that I could have sworn. When she was near enough to touch me, she reached out her hand and blindly I took it. It was soft, so soft and I could smell her, the fragrance of the wind and the sea. Slowly she pulled me against her soft body. I was lost. I could feel it. I was going to return her embrace when my dagger nicked me, just a little, in the arm and I woke as if from a dream and saw what was facing me. Without thinking, I stabbed her in the chest, hard bringing down the bronze weapon into her beautiful bosom with my two hands. To my surprise, my blade passed through her body into thin air, and I almost stumbled. What the? Then I remembered and in my mind Apo was screaming. She's behind you. She's behind you. Stop backwards. Gripping the metal with all the strength my 12-year-old body could muster. I drove the dagger backwards, not surprised this time, when I encountered firm flesh, which quickly yielded and buried my blade to the hilt. The image in front of me vanished, and when I turned around, there she was, the man alive, breathing with pain, clutching her stomach, as she tries to curl the flowing of her blood. In seconds, her immaculate gown turned crimson. I ran and never looked back. I found my brothers awake and waiting for me by the doors. They told me they were about to wake up my parents and tell them what happened. Then they saw my bloody arms and hands, and the blade still dripping with the man alive's blood. Fernando ran to our parents' bedroom and banged for all he was worth, and they came out, Apo came out, and they saw what I had done. All of us went back to the place where I fought the man alive, each of us bringing a weapon, but the man alive was no longer there. All that remained was a puddle of blood, dark and ominous in the moonlight. The next morning, the whole town searched for a wounded woman, and even the local officials were pursued to join the hunt once we told them what happened. But we didn't find her nor was any woman reported to have died in the next few days. But the killing stopped after that, and to my brothers, and even to the other children, I was no longer Tonyo the Wimp. Overnight, I had become Tonyo the Brave, and that was the name I became known for, for the rest of my life. Yes, yes, that was a nice story, my dear, a nice story. But there are no more stories like that. Tomorrow. I'll tell you instead about how the river Polangi came to be. It too is a nice story. Now you go on bed. It's already late. Lolo Tonyo is sad and you have to go to school tomorrow. Good night. Good night. We are now done storytelling about the bravery of Tonyo in facing the Manlalayog. So the story gives us many lessons and these are 
always listen to elders as they know more about than us. Sometimes you need to be strong. And lastly, we all need to sacrifice sometimes for the good of our family.